Hi, I'm Krista Harrison. I am faculty in the Division of Geriatrics. I have a PhD in Bioethics and Health Policy. Today we'll be talking about justice and health. In this first part, I'm going to provide an overview, and we're going to talk about some of the key theories of justice in the context of a particular scenario. Why do we talk about ethics? Fundamentally, we are trying to hone your gut instincts about what you think is right and wrong, and then give you some language to talk about it. When I think about ethics, I think about the overarching theories of how the world ought to be. There are a lot of theories about this. People disagree. So other people have said, well, let's go with mid-level principles that everyone can agree is relevant to informed decision making. That's called principalism. You probably are familiar with four of these. Autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence are three we're not going to talk about today. We're going to focus on justice. So what do we mean when we're talking about justice? I think it's always helpful to start with how do people define it? How do experts define it? So Beecham and Childress wrote the Principles of Biomedical Ethics. It's a commonly used resource. I highly recommend it. And what they define the overarching theory of justice as is fair, equitable, and appropriate treatment in light of what is due to or owed to other people. And within the concept of justice is a concept of distributive justice because there are a number of goods and services in society that, that people need to receive. So distributive justice is fair, equitable, and appropriate distribution determined by justified norms that structure the terms of social cooperation, all rights and responsibilities. For those of you for whom this is new, Distributive justice is one part of the overarching concept of justice. So there are a lot of goods to distribute in society, and health is a fairly complicated one to think about. So first think about something as simple as a plate of cookies with a horde of hungry toddlers. One way to distribute those cookies would be everybody gets an equal share. Another would be according to the free market, insofar as toddlers are capable of that. There are also other ways according to need, effort, contribution, or merit. Take a moment and think about which of these uh, sort of basic ways to distribute goods feels most like the way you think about things. So before we go further, and I'm going to tell you more about the different theories of distributive justice, I want to point out that where you grew up, where you spend time, the communities you spend time in, all influence the way that you think about justice. The United States was founded on a philosophy of freedom and liberty, at least for white men at the time, and other countries think differently. So in Europe, there are often big social safety net programs that are based on a value of solidarity, of support for each other. Uh, and so organizations work similarly, where the how you allocate resources if your organization's core value is based on uh, serving people in underserved populations is very different than the decisions an organization that is dedicated to maxim maximizing profits for a stakeholder group might be. So keep that in mind that if you're finding that you gravitate one way or another, that that may be influenced by your context. In a society where we have limitless resources, we don't have to think about distributive justice because everybody has everything they could possibly want. And we don't live in that world. All resources are scarce, even if we pretend otherwise at a patient bedside where you're trying to figure out how to serve their needs. You don't necessarily have to think about whether they'll be able to get the medication. But increasingly in the United States, as well as the rest of the world, there are significant resource shortages that impact patient care. So let's talk about an example. Say it's 10 years from now, you are now working at a public health hospital. There's pandemic influenza. We've got vaccines that are available, but maybe it's early in the season uh, and the vaccines aren't in great supply just yet. So you, as a medical director at the Zuckerberg, have to create a prioritization list of who will get these vaccines first. 
As you can imagine, the threatened populations are the usual people who are vulnerable, children, pregnant women, older adults with multiple chronic conditions, but also the people who are providing them with health care and public officials who have roles like making sure the trash doesn't pile up or keeping us from starting a nuclear war. What are you going to do? How are you going to decide who gets what vaccines first? So this is where we're going to start going through some of the jargon. The first way you might think about distributing resources, these vaccines, is first come, first serve. Whether you are young, old, child, direct care worker, everybody gets the same. But maybe you're uncomfortable with this strict egalitarian uh, way of allocating resources because you've got Ruth Bader Ginsburg, your child, the president of the United States. They all have equal access, and the only difference is based on whether or not they know that they need to get the vaccine, whether they need uh, know how to, and that it's going to be important for them to get it. So maybe you say and said, well, let's let the market decide. Let's let the people, let's let the drug companies decide what is the fair market value of the vaccine and let them make the decision. Keep the state out of it, keep the government out of it, keep organizations out of it. Uh, we'll just, we'll let the drug companies decide. So that would be more of a libertarian view where um, people get to have access to things based on their, often their ability to pay. So maybe you're thinking, I don't know, I worked really hard for my medical degree. I'm putting myself at risk on the front lines. I think that I deserve to be higher on the prioritization list because of all this work I've done and where my role in society. That is called dessert-based justice. In other words, what you deserve. And yes, it's spelled with one S. So that would be another way to make this allocation decision about vaccines. There's another philosophy as well, utilitarianism, which is about maximizing welfare with health being one aspect of that welfare. And that says that the whatever decisions you make about this prior, prioritization list, you need to make sure that the maximum good comes to society. And so maybe you decide that because of that, what you're going to do is you're going to put children at the top of the list because they have the most uh, of their lives ahead of them, and they are going to have the most opportunity to do good in society. Or for similar reasons or similar, similar rationale, you might say, well, actually, again, going back to the frontline workers, the physicians like me, nurses, social workers, uh, everyone who works in hospital settings, they deserve to have access to those vaccines first because if they are healthy and maybe also if their families are healthy, if you offer vaccines to their families, they will be able to come to work and care for everyone who's sick, and that will have the maximum uh, good to society. And so in these last couple slides, we've, we've sort of started talking about the fact that Everybody is different in society, and there needs to be some way to accommodate that in a, a justice-based process. So John Rawls is a philosopher who came up with the idea that a just society would be one where you decide how to allocate resources and goods based on not knowing where you'll be in society. So it's a veil of ignorance. And he says that as long as everybody has an opportunity and health is a key component of opportunity, that it's okay to treat people differently. The caveat is he says it is important that the people who are least off in society actually have the opportunity to benefit. So you can't just make the rich richer at expense of the poor getting poorer. So under the difference principle, you might say, Again, the children should be top of the list because they have the most opportunity ahead of them in life, and it makes sense to treat them differently. And maybe beyond just all children, you want to say that children from disadvantaged backgrounds, the children who are refugees, children who come from other types of underprivileged backgrounds, that they should obtain first dibs on these vaccines. 
So capabilities is another of these methods to allocate resources in a just society. And that's based on the thought that health is a key element of our capability to engage in the world doing activities that we find valuable. So under a capabilities approach to justice, you would potentially, again, decide that children need to be prioritized first because they, their you need to enable their capability to engage in the world over the course of their life. Finally, the, there's a perspective about prioritizing resources that says life is like a baseball game, and people who have just been born are at the top of the first inning, and people who are in their 80s or 90s are in their ninth inning. They're at the end of their life, relatively speaking and that everybody should have a go with their fair number of innings, but that maybe people who are in the eighth and ninth inning should forego care or be deprioritized in order that we give priority to the people who are at the beginning, at, in, uh, early in the game. So again, that would, that would put children higher on the list and actually deprioritize older adults. So at this point, you've got to be throwing up your hands saying, I don't get it. There's a lot of ways to do this. It seems like reasonable people would disagree. I don't know what to do. How, how can this be my job to decide this prioritization list? So one of the things you can do is say, well, let's at least make the process of making this decision fair. So that could be referred to as procedural justice. The most common account of procedural justice is called accountability for reasonableness, which says there are four elements for a fair process. The first is relevance, that you choose criteria for your decision that reasonable people agree are relevant. So if eye color has nothing to do with the virulence of influenza or the efficacy of the vaccine, it may not have a reasonable role in your prioritization scheme. The next piece is publicity or transparency. Whatever criteria you come up with for your prioritization scheme and the actual outcome of your prioritization scheme, you want to make that public. That gives you an opportunity to involve key stakeholders. The third piece is appeals. You want to provide a process by which you can incorporate new information and go back and change what you did. Or sometimes you just get it wrong and you need to do it again. The final piece is enforcement. You need to have a mechanism in place to make sure this fair process actually occurs. It is easier to make decisions behind closed doors where people can't see, but it is not necessarily as fair. Now, I've given you a lot of different ways to think about how to make resource allocation decisions. Think about what would you do if you really were in charge of making a prioritization scheme for a vaccine for a deadly pandemic flu, what would you do? And know also that I've thrown out a lot of jargon and I have touched on it in the just the tip of the iceberg. There have been books written on each of these slides and then other books disagreeing with those books. So know that there's, for those of you who are interested, there's lots more out there for you.